a son that they will name Isaac. And when the conversation with Abraham and Sarah draws to a close, these men, these angels, the Lord rise to continue their journey towards Sodom. In chapter 18, verse 16, <clears throat> we simply read, Then the men rose up from there and looked down toward Sodom, and Abraham was walking with them to send them off. If we drop down just a couple verses to verse 20, And the Lord said, The outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah is indeed great. Their sin is exceedingly grave. I will go down now and see if they have done entirely according to its outcry, which has come to me. And if not, I will know. Very simply, the Lord is going to make an assessment. The Lord, accompanied by these two angels, are going to go to these two cities, of which He has heard much, even in the hallowed halls of the throne room of heaven. The outcry. Is great. And the sin is grave. This was no minor detail. This was no simple slip. This was living life totally contrary to the design of God. I want to share with you a couple of passages of Scripture. Three that kind of give us some insight. In the book of Ezekiel, of all places, Ezekiel the prophet, I'll get there, promise. I used to flip pages faster than I do today. Ezekiel chapter 16, verses 49 and 50, God is, is, is speaking through His prophet and, and talking about the unfaithfulness of his people, the Jewish people, and particularly those who live in Jerusalem. But he makes an example for them. He takes them back in time in verses 49 and 50. And he says this, Behold, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had arrogance, abundant food and careless ease. But she did not help the poor and needy. Thus they were haughty and committed abominations before me. Therefore I removed them when I saw it. Notice where the prophet begins. They must have been a rather affluent city. They had plenty of food and they lived in careless ease. They, they kind of kicked back, they put the foot up on the recliner. They watched the Saturday football games go Iowa. Oh, I forgot. I live in Illinois now. The orange and blue don't do real well on the football field. And they just kind of took care of themselves. And did you notice what they didn't do? They had no compassion, they had no care, they had no concern, and they did not touch the lives of the poor and the needy. That could be a very modern issue, couldn't it? Lack of compassion towards the poor and the needy while we live comfortably with what God has blessed us with. But he says... In that carelessness, then, they committed abominations. Sins that were what? Exceedingly grave. No small matter before God. But interestingly enough, God does not choose in Ezekiel to give any insight, any clue into what that might have been. So if I turn way back in the New Testament to 2 Peter chapter 2, beginning at verse 4. The, pro, uh, the apostle speaks a lot about judgment and when judgment falls. In 2 Peter chapter 2, beginning at verse 4, <clears throat> For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, 
but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment and did not spare the ancient world but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, along with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. And if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, having made them an example to those who would live ungodly lives thereafter. And if he rescued righteous Lot, oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men, for by what he saw and heard, that righteous man while living among them felt his righteous soul tormented day after day by their lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment, and especially those who indulge the flesh in its corrupt desires and despise authority. I find it interesting that as we read those words, Lot's righteous soul. Remember, Lot is Abraham's nephew. Lot had chosen the fertile valley of the Jordan, which emptied out into what today is the Dead Sea near Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot had chosen that area. But his righteous soul, we're told, was tormented day after day by the lawless deeds, the sensual conduct of unprincipled men, amongst whom he lived. I would say we live in a very similar culture. And I would ask this, is your soul tormented? Does sin and unrighteous behavior of our society trouble you? Or is it, oh well, what shall be, shall be. Is it live and let live? You know, I, I hear sometimes, even from people who attend worship services, just let people be and do what they want. Don't you care about them? Jesus loves them. And I want to say, yes, Jesus loves them. He loves them enough that he went to the cross to die for their sin, which separates them from God. Do you really just love them enough to let them walk into hell? Or do you love them enough? To speak truth to them. You know, the U.S. Supreme Court can legalize what it will. It doesn't make it right. Schools can teach whatever the departments of education approve. It doesn't make it true. The entertainment industry can seek to normalize aberrant behavior. And we watch it day and night on our TV screens or we hear it in the music that we listen to. And that doesn't make it right. God is the determiner of truth and error, of right and wrong, of righteousness and sinfulness. And Sodom, it was a mess. If you turn over to the little bitty book of Jude, Jude verses 5 through 7, don't worry about which chapter, there's only one. Jude writes, Now I desire to remind you, though you know all things once for all, that the Lord, after saving a people out of the land of Egypt, subsequently destroyed those who did not believe. And angels who did not keep their own domain but abandoned their proper abode, he has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since they in the same way as these indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh, are exhibited as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. Yes, Virginia, there is a hell. You can deny it all you want. But there is a hell. And unfortunately, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All. That includes you and me. You understand that? 
But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. And so even in the midst of gross immorality, there is hope, as Ryan spoke of. There is an extension of grace. And it's interesting what we see as we go back to the book of Genesis. I want to look at just some of the characters in the story. Have you ever gone to a play and you take the program and you read through the cast of characters? You get a little bit of a feel for what's about to unfold. In our story in chapter 18, remember, the Lord has spoken with Abraham. But as these men rise up in verse 16 of 18 and look down towards Sodom, Abraham was walking with them to send them off. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Since Abraham will surely become a great and mighty nation, and in him all the nations of the earth will be blessed. For I have chosen him so that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice, so that the Lord may bring upon Abraham what he has spoken about him. God himself says, I need to read Abraham in to what's going on. I need to help him understand because of who he is, because of his chosen state before me as the father of faith. And that would probably include us. God has let us in on the story. He's told us what lies ahead, both for righteous and unrighteous alike, so that we might bring light into our dark world, so that we might speak truth in opposition to error. And what does Abraham do? If you continue to read, and I actually preached this earlier this year when we talked about prayer and how Abraham interceded on behalf of the righteous. He interceded on behalf of the righteous. God, would you spare the wicked on behalf of the righteous? And Abraham begins in his prayer to barter with God. If there's 50 righteous people in Sodom, will you let Sodom survive? And God says, sure. And he begins to barter 40, 30, 20 he even gets it down to 10. If 10 righteous can be found in Sodom, will you spare the city? And God says, yes, I will. But isn't it interesting, if you know the story, that only four escape and of them only three survive. Lot, his wife, and their two daughters. His wife we're going to talk about in a minute because she didn't quite make it. Abraham's heart was indeed for justice. In verse 23 of chapter 18, he asks God a question. He says, will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? And in verse 25, Abraham asks another question. Shall not the judge of all the earth deal justly? Shall not God do what is right? And I hope that you understand that yes, indeed, he will. But he is judge. An aspect of who God is that we have tended to forgotten. Oh, as Rich Mullins put it, I hope that we have not too quickly forgotten that our God is an awesome God. How about that our God is a holy God? That our God is the judge of all the earth. Well, in chapter 19, just to reiterate a little bit for you, if you don't remember the story, Two angels arrive. These men of the city, though, come to Lot. Lot sees them enter the city. He invites them, hey, come into my house. I'll put you up for the night. We'll feed you. And they say, no, we'll just sleep in the city court. That was kind of common back in that day. Lot, knowing where it was that he lived, knew that that was not wise nor safe. And he says, come into my house. And so the angels agree, they're in Lot's house, and before you know it, the men of the city have gathered outside their front door and are beating on it mercilessly. Verse 5 of chapter 19. Here is the problem. 
They called out to Lot and they said to him, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may have relations with them. Do I have to spell that out? This is, this, this is rape. And it is homosexual rape. And Lot's heart, remember? Lot was what? His righteous soul was tormented. It hurt him. And now the story gets weird. Lot's trying to protect these two men who obviously are, <laughs> there's something different about them. Remember, they're angels. <laughs> and he, he wants to protect them. And sometimes even the righteous do stupid things. And I don't want to gloss over this because this is, Lot pulls a dumb stunt. He sticks his head out the door and he says, I'll tell you what, leave these men aside, but I have two virgin daughters. I'll send them out to you. What? Are you nuts? You ladies, think about that. Lot is desperate. That's the only defense that I can make of him. Lot is desperate. And he doesn't know how to respond or what to do, so he's going to offer his daughters as sacrifices, in essence. No, that's not going to work. That's not what God wants. That's not the heart of God. But as Lot has his head stuck out, it's interesting what begins to unfold. Let me get the right verse here. Verse 9, chapter 19. They said, these are the men of the city of Sodom, stand aside. Get out of the way. We're going to take these men. Pretty stupid. You're taking on angels from heaven. <laughs> it gets good. Furthermore, they said, this one, they're talking of Lot, you, Lot, came in as an alien, as an outsider, as an immigrant. You aren't native to Sodom. Who are you? What do you think you have to say to us? He's acting like a judge. Oh, that's very contemporary. How dare you judge me? Who are you to judge do you hear? This is the world speaking to the righteous, saying, you're acting like a judge. Who do you think you are? Now we will treat you worse than them. The world will do no less in regards to you and to me if we pursue righteousness. As with Lot, standing against evil may cost you dearly. I, I find it interesting that in our culture, anytime you speak truth into darkness, all of a sudden you're labeled as having a phobia. You're an Islamophobe. You know what phobia is? It's fear. It's the ancient Greek word for fear. And so you're afraid of Islam. Let me tell you something. No, I'm not. I disagree with the teachings of Islam. Or you're a homophobe. You're afraid of homosexuality. No, I'm not. I just want to uphold the teachings of God regarding human sexuality. You're transphobe. It, no, I'm not. I'm not afraid of people who have transgender issues. I simply want to uphold the biblical teaching in regards to gender. I would never do it because I don't want to get into the argument, but I think there are people in our culture who are truth-phobic, Bible-phobic, and Jesus-phobic. Because if they were to listen to the truth of the Word as revealed through Christ our Lord, it would put their sin in the spotlight and call them to repentance. And that's not just the sin of those that we would label sinful. It's also your sin and mine. Are we humble are we repentant? Do we seek His mercy? Do we seek His grace? Well, the angels speak to Lot in verses 12 to 14. Then the two men said to Lot, Whom else do you have? Do you have any family here in Sodom? A son-in-law? Sons? Daughters? Whomever you have in the city, bring them out of the place 
for we are about to destroy this place because their outcry has become so great before the Lord and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. Remember, great was the outcry of Sodom and the Lord says, I will go down and I'll see for myself. And now the verdict is in. This place is beyond redemption and we are going to destroy it. But Lot, gather your family together and go. Verse 14, listen to this. Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law who were to marry his daughters. Okay, remember his daughters are virgin girls, but they're not married yet, but they're engaged. These are their fiancés. And he says, oh, get out of this place. The Lord's going to destroy the city. But he appeared to his sons-in-law to be jesting. Oh, you and your dad jokes. <laughs> you think you're funny, but you're really not. How dangerous to hear the warning of God and shrug it off as a joke. God's mercy is wide. God's mercy is wide. His grace is available to all. There is none that does not need the Lord, and there is none that the Lord cannot reach. His mercy is wide, but so many simply reject it. They won't see, they can't see the coming judgment. In verses 15 and 16 of chapter 9, the angels now say, Go. Go. The time is now. Go, run, flee. Actually says, go to the mountains. And Lot says, I'm old, I'm fat, I'm tired, I can't. Can I just go to Zoar? <laughs> Zoar means small thing. It was a little bitty town. <laughs> you know, maybe 30, 40 people live there. Can I just go to Zoar? It's not much, it doesn't have much significance. Would you spare Zoar if I can get there? And the angels kind of roll their eyes, shrug their shoulders and say, okay, fine. Are we ever like Lot? God says, flee to the mountains. Go to the place of safety. And we say, eh, can we find a plan B, God? Plan A is just too much for me. I'm not comfortable with plan A. I can't get to the mountains. How about I just go over to this small place? It's pretty insignificant anyway, and I can just hide out there. Is that okay, God? Sometimes we do that. We're just like Lot. And then Lot hesitates. God has told him directly, I am going to destroy this place. I'm going to destroy it now. Run. And Lot's going, well, you know, I probably ought to run down to the bank and close out my account. You know, I'm, I'm not sure that I've got enough Cliff Bars and Gatorade to make the journey over to Zoar, so I ought to stop at Dollar General. I'm sure there was a Dollar General in Sodom. There's one everywhere. And, you know, he, he, he's hesitating. Do we ever hesitate? When God says, now, and we go, later? Judgment's coming. And we hesitate. And here's another picture of grace. If you read verses 15 and 16, the angels actually take him by the hand. They physically take a hold of Lot and drag him out of the city and then figuratively, this isn't in the text, kick him in the backside and say, get going. And Lot and his wife and his two daughters, just the four of them, finally leave. Now look at verse 16. In the midst of this story of judgment, please. But he, Lot, hesitated. So the men seized his hand and the hand of his wife and the hands of his two daughters for the compassion of the Lord was upon him. And they brought him out and put him outside the city. For the compassion of the Lord was upon him. 
God is a compassionate God. Even in the midst of the story of judgment, there is the compassion of the Lord. Oh, he would save all. And he speaks and he says, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. If you read the story of Sodom and Gomorrah and think that somehow God was having fun, you are wrong. I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. It breaks his heart. Hence, Rich Mullins wrote, judgment and wrath he poured out on Sodom. Mercy and grace he gave us at the cross. And that's the story. So Lot and his wife, their two daughters flee. And you know the story, don't you? In verse 17, the angels have said, don't even turn around. Don't look back. Flee. And again, the instructions just didn't sink in. Lot's wife does what? She turns back. And she is taken up in the judgment that destroys Sodom. We're told she became a pillar of salt. Judgment overtook her. Is that like us? We say, Jesus, I want to follow you. You are my Lord. You are my King. Where you lead, I will follow. And we're walking along the road of discipleship. And we just, wow. I miss what was back here. And we turn back. We're drawn back by an addiction, by a sin, by a person, by a thing. And instead of keeping our eyes on Jesus, we, we long for where we came from rather than for where we're going. No, we don't turn into a pillar of salt. But it weakens our discipleship in the moment. And judgment came. 1924, not the year, chapter and verse. Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah, brimstone and fire, from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the valley and all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground. Fire and brimstone. That's the most fire and brimstone I can give you, folks. Sorry. But it's in the... Can you imagine that? That's, a, that's why I found this picture on the internet. I don't know who drew that. You know, but you got Lot and his two daughters on the left fleeing. You got his wife back there looking like a statue because she's now a pillar of salt. And a fire and brimstone rain. Judgment. Why? Because the hearts of the people of Sodom had grown so cold toward God, so hard set against his ways, and they embraced gross evil. They had no concern for the poor and the needy. And they gave themselves to such aberrant sexual behavior that they had almost ceased to be human. And God said, enough. Enough. And the last picture of the story I find interesting. Remember where we began? God has been speaking with Abraham, tells him about the child of promise. The two angels rise and head on down to Sodom. The Lord stays and talks with Abraham and says, Shall I keep Abraham in the dark? No, I'll read him in to the judgment that is about to befall these cities. And when we get down to the end of the story, verse 27, Now Abraham arose early in the morning, and went to the place where he had stood before the Lord. And he looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the valley. And he saw, and behold, the smoke of the land ascended like the smoke of a furnace. We begin with God talking with Abraham about what's going to happen. We end with Abraham 
standing there with his cup of coffee, kosher, I'm sure, looking down from his hill land to the valley, and smoke rises like the smoke of a furnace. Devastation, destruction, judgment has fallen. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might have life. God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. But my friends, judgment is coming. Whether it be today or two millennia from now, judgment will come. May we be like Abraham and intercede. May we be like Lot and feel it in our bones, in our gut, in our heart, in our soul, that it torments us to live in a culture that has rejected the ways of God, that promotes, that, that presents and celebrates evil and calls evil good and calls good evil. But rather than getting so mad that we want to punch someone, may it bring us to our knees with tears running down our cheeks with love and compassion for those facing judgment. And may we care enough for them not to just pat them on the back and say, hey, you be you, but to share with them the transforming gospel of Jesus Christ and say, you be who God made you to be. And then, judgment won't fall. There will be life. Would you stand as we sing? on a lighter note uh, some of you are as old as I am in the 1960s when we would watch Batman how did the show always end same bat time same bat channel remember calling you back next week today we talk judgment the next two stories in the book of Genesis if you haven't read ahead are weird. <laughs> All right? Cover your little children's ears. We've got incest and giving your wife to another man. That's weird. Okay? I'm not trying to say don't be here. We're talking about weird stuff. I'm saying we need to be here and hear these stories. Why did God put this stuff in the Bible? You know, I think sometimes we read the Bible and we go, oh, God, how could you? Well, God did because he has a reason. And maybe rather than being shocked, we should listen to what he has to say. So I hope to see you next week. I've had people taking down your names. I know who's here. And if you're absent. 
<laughs> and if you're absent, you're in trouble. <laughs> May the Lord bless you and keep you. I, I have nothing left to say. <laughs>